the first two bed flats that we rented in Newcastle <laughs> was 500 pounds. I could not believe it. I'm like, <laughs> are you sure they're not trying to scam me? And then I'm like, you know what? Yeah, no job is worth me being sad over. So then I, I sent my resignation notice in while I was on annual leave. The conflict, communication, change management. If you can find three good scenarios and keep them under your belt using star, you'll probably be able to get away with most interviews. You would show or portray those elements, then you will likely be able to answer most NHS interview questions. Most, at least. I think I'm responsible for about nearly 350 to almost 400 staff altogether. Today I've got Karen with me, who is a clinical nurse educator. And today she's going to be discussing, chatting, talking with us about life and career as a nurse. In the united kingdom so, so sit tight like the video leave me comments below subscribe if you have not and please share with your nurse friends hey karen hi how are you, how are you doing? <laughs> good good how are you doing thank you so much for doing this oh no worries at all it's a pleasure to be here thank you um so i met karen at the christmas market some <laughs> months ago yeah, yeah about two months yeah. ago yeah actually I about two months ago October. yeah <laughs> castle christmas market and mm -hmm. i'm so glad that she stopped me because <laughs> if she didn't we won't be having this conversation right now so thank you so much for being a um, uh, supporter of the channel so let's start with who you are so who is karen can you just give us a bit of a background about who you are and yeah well my name is karen as you already said and i'm a nurse which is probably why i'm here but um in my free time what do i like to do i like to sleep i'm not one to want to go anywhere so i guess my name is karen and i love sleep i am currently married to my very wonderful husband and we've just recently moved from london we now live in newcastle and we're just navigating what newcastle feels like really and trying to make sure that we get settled we enjoy it and we're happy and what else is there about me that must is there anything interesting about me i'm terrible with direction so even if you give me the same direction <laughs> a million and one times if i don't use my map i promise you i'm going to get lost <laughs> so <laughs> that's me oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh thank you so much for that um mm -hmm. told me you are a clinical nurse educator mm -hmm. yeah so how did you get there like how did you get to that you know being a band six in the nhs and not just <laughs> any not just any specialty a clinical nurse educator like <laughs> educating <laughs> upcoming nurses and helping nurses to get better at their jobs so how did you get there give us a bit of a background about your nursing journey you know where you studied and things like that yeah sure absolutely and just to say actually i know nursing educator sounds funny but you're honestly using funny to the ghetto but um yeah my background so i didn't always start up being a nurse i actually had my first degree in international relations at obafe miyawada university and Ooh. then i think afterwards i moved great, to... great. great. <laughs> <laughs> um afterwards i moved fully to be back with my family in england um backstory my family moved when i was 15 and we all moved but because i was in uni at the time already um they kind of thought it might be a bit disruptive so i chose to stay back in nigeria to finish my first degree before i then moved back to the uk so um when i moved back to the uk after uni I got a job working for Domestic and General, which is an insurance company. But um, I think about five months into the job, I realized I didn't like it very much and I wanted to do something else. And from the very moment that I, my family actually moved to the UK, my mom, who is a nurse, has always pressed for me to go Ooh. do something. And I just wasn't a party to it. I didn't think I wanted to be a nurse. I didn't see myself being a nurse. It just, it just wasn't something I thought I would ever do. But I think it was just a spur of the moment. I was at work that day and I was just frustrated. I'm like, you know what? I'm actually going to go look online and see what this whole nursing thing is about and see if I can still get in. So I'd mm -hmm. gone in, I'd gone online to kind of see what schools I could potentially go to or what things I could consider. And I remember, I think it was, I think I had about a week before the whole application process actually closed when I'd gone online to find out. So I'd gone on that day, written my personal statement, applied to a couple of schools. So I applied to, um, I think I applied to King's College, I applied to London South Bank, then what's that other school? City University of London, I think it's called. And I applied to Swansea University, which is in 
Wales. I think they're in Wales. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and I applied to that one. But the one in Wales was a fully funded government program, which would have meant that at the end, I would have had to stay in Wales for two years before I then could go ahead and do whatever I wanted with my life. My mom wasn't quite comfortable with that because obviously I'd be far from home and far from family. So that kind of went out the window, even though I did get the admission. But yeah, my mom wasn't too keen on it. So I had to pick one of the three other schools that I applied to. And it might be worth mentioning that um, my brother also applied to nurses for around this time. So um, I know. And we, I think we wow. applied to the same three schools, <laughs> actually. <laughs> so we got into all three schools. And at the point where... I think, I can't remember, they called me saying, oh, I think I got into both Kings and I got into South Bank. But at the time I was doing my application, I didn't realize that I'd put South Bank as my first choice and Kings as my second choice. So when oh, it was kind so of actually... Sorry, so there's yeah. something like first choice, second choice here also. Yeah. So, um, yes, actually there is. Because I applied mm. through, I can't remember the name of that website, but it's a website everybody uses to apply to universities. I, can't, I, I honestly don't remember what it's called now. Mm-hmm. And you can you kind of like get to pick the, three sco- the first three schools that you'd like. Well, you only get to pick three. The three schools that you would like. And those were my three, um, three schools that I wanted. So because I got into all three, ideally I could have decided which one I wanted to go for. So it could have been Kings, could have been City, or it could have been south bank but at the time i didn't know that you could actually change what your first choice was i thought you had to go to your first choice so i ended up going to london south bank university to do the postgraduate degree which was two years and then my brother went to king's so i did my nursing degree in london south bank university and i'm actually glad i did because it was a home away from home kind of school there were a lot of nigerians in my class which really helped because um, it meant that I didn't feel as overwhelmed, especially because I was coming from a completely different background. The only yeah. healthcare experience I had as such was, um, so before you actually, sorry, I, I should have mentioned this. Before I got into the nursing degree, one of the requirements was I had to have some sort of healthcare experience. So I had to take a job in a residential home for, for maybe like three months or something along those lines. So I did that and then went, so I quit my job um, at the insurance company, did the residential home job for a few months and then got into nursing school. So did my two years program, I had all my placements at um, Guys and St. Thomas' Hospital in London, which is where I started working after I qualified. So unfortunately, I was one of them once that qualified smack in the middle of the pandemic. So um, oh. I got to do the aspirant nurse thing which was like the six months program where if you're your in your final year instead of having your management placement you got to kind of like have a six month paid placement on the ward wherever you want to work so i i opted in to do that instead of just sitting at home and waiting for the pandemic to finish so i opted into the six months paid program and we used to get called aspirant nurses then and essentially you're kind of like what the equivalent of a nursing associate I imagine would be here. So you can do, mm. excuse me, pretty much everything that um, a nurse would do, except that we weren't allowed to do IVs and we still had to be supervised to do most things. Mm. But otherwise, it was fun. <laughs> I was getting paid for my placement. It was like the nursing student dream at the time. I qualified and I started working on the ward where I did my aspirant nurse training. Because once again, in your final placement, you get to decide where you want to have your final placement in. So my options that I had chosen was A&E, a general medical ward, and I can't remember the third one. I think it was a gastrosurgical ward. I'd had a placement there and I liked. So initially, I was posted to a stroke ward, which I did not want. <laughs> and thankfully, <laughs> thankfully, um, they did some reallocation again. They said, okay, you know what, you go to a general medical ward. I know you want A&E, but if opportunities open in A&E, we'll push you to A&E because it was during COVID and they didn't want students in A&E because that would have meant you in the front line and they were exposing you a lot more than you should be. So I agreed to stay on the general medical ward. And I think two weeks afterwards, they told me there was opening in A&E if I wanted to go over, but I'd already started in the general medical ward. I just chose to stay there, which I'm glad I did actually. All of the success that I have today as a nurse is really just <laughs> tied to God and the nurses I had on that ward because I had a lot of great mentors on that ward. And once again, it was a nurse that had quite a number of Nigerians. So I felt very at home, mm-hmm. which really helped. <clears throat> and yeah i started off qualified on that word and i think it was i was about seven months thereabout 
into being a band five when a band six position had come up on the ward and i'd remember some of the band six is saying to me oh i think you should really apply for that because i think that you know you look like you would be able to do the job and i'm like what are you people talking about i literally qualified like five days ago but then i kept getting encouraged to apply for it so i'm like you know what? okay i'm actually going to apply for it so i applied for it and i got the job so i became a band six actually i think about seven almost eight months <laughs> please. <Let's go>. what? <laughs> please. like in less than a year Absolutely. of you qualifying mm-hmm. wow that's amazing thank you thank you <laughs> Yeah, so I became a band six nurse on that ward and it was fun, it was really challenging, but I really enjoyed it. It was it was oh, a great on that ward. You became a yeah, band six ward. on that ward. Yes. On the general ward. Yes, on the general medical ward. So it's kind of like what your the ward was kind of like your step down from A and E. So it'd be mm-hmm. like your general medical admissions ward ish so yes i became a band six on there and i was there until may 2022 when i decided i wanted to move to newcastle i don't think i had a specific reason i think it was just on a whim i used to live in brighton with my parents before i moved to london for nursing school where i then started working in london and i knew that i didn't want to stay in london for too long because I had plans, I had goals, very lofty goals, and I, I just always thought London was not the place, it was too expensive. It didn't feel like the place for a growing professional to kind of like hustle hard enough and then be able to kind of make the, cover the grounds that I wanted to cover in the period of time I'd given myself. And as much as I know that, yes, it's possible for most of people, but on a nurse's salary, you, you'll be working yeah. a lot. <laughs> so yeah. I'm like, yeah, <laughs> it, that's not working. So I actually started looking at um, Birmingham, that was where I wanted to move to initially. And, you know, I started the process. I'd gone to look at houses. I already had a job offer that was pretty much almost matching my band six salary in London at the time. And my friend, who lives in Newcastle, actually, I think very randomly we'd reconnected and that spoken to her. She was like, oh, she lives in Newcastle and it's actually really affordable. It's a nice place. I'm like, you know what? Maybe I should actually consider Newcastle as well if it's cheap. So I started looking at Newcastle, started applying to jobs in Newcastle. And once again, I got a job that matched my band six salary. The only difference was, so the job I got in um, um, was for CGL, Change Grow Life, which is kind of like a substance misuse charity, which is fairly related to what I used to do in London because we had a um, alcohol detox suite on my ward where I used to work. It was a um, pri- kind of like a private suite on my ward where we used to work. So it was very related to what I was doing and I enjoyed it. So I figured not too bad. But the job I had gotten in Newcastle, on the other hand, was for a rehab unit, so one of the NHS intermediate care units, and I'd been offered the position of a clinical lead, um, which I thought career-wise seemed, at the time, (laughs) it seemed a lot more sensible for career progression, because as much as I knew that I wanted to take a job that was going to give me the same salary that the NHS was offering me in London at the time, I was also mindful of the fact that if I joined the NHS straight away in Newcastle, they weren't going to match that salary. Because in London, I got the London waiting, which meant that my salary was about 6K or there about more, or 7K there about more than what I would get anywhere else. So I didn't want to take that pay cut. So um, I kept looking at jobs that would offer me more money. So thankfully, the intermediate care facility, although was NHS, was um, kind of like the building or the facility itself was owned by a private company. So I was employed by the private company to work for the NHS, which meant I got a private company salary, but I was working within the NHS, if that makes sense. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I figured that was a nice transition because it meant that when I go back to the NHS, which was my plan, I would be going back, say, as a ward sister or just something a bit more in IR management because it was a clinical lead role and I expected it to be a lot more management related. So I took that job over the one in Birmingham and I chose to come to Newcastle. So... I moved to Newcastle and I think that was when I think I'd reached out to you back then saying I was considering moving out moving to Newcastle. I wasn't sure what the environment was like for nurses and agency work, blah 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 blah. And you had very kindly responded and given me what you thought. And I think you even also gave me recommendations on what sort of like areas I could look at in terms of where to live and stuff. So thank you very much for that. <laughs> was not what it was painted to be oh, <laughs> <really>? <laughs> every day i spent in that job i was depressed also 
I was very depressed. So um, oh. the idea that I'd gotten from the job was it was supposed to be more management based. I would have I would have clinical days, but my clinical days were more of an oversight of sort of like just so I knew what was happening within the clinical area as opposed to just being in the office and doing like the management bit. But at the time I took the job, um, what I was told supposedly was I was going to be the nurse and I was going to have like another sort of like an equivalent with nursing associates on the floor with me alongside my other um, care assistants. It was a 20 bedded unit. And we had like, you know, your nurse, uh, what they call them, your, your nurse practitioners and your OTs and your yeah. physios and those people. So I was supposed to technically work within that multidisciplinary team overseeing the um, activities of the whole unit. So when I got to the unit, I realized <laughs> I was the only nurse on the unit. And oh. I never had the number of care assistants that I was promised, which meant I was both the care assistant to the nurse on the floor, the nurse in the office, the social worker, the OT. I was everything. <laughs> I was everything. And it was really overwhelming. And I think the unit had been coming in. So at the time I joined the unit, one thing actually that I probably would point out, if you ever to work with a unit like that, please always make sure you know what their CQC ratings are. So <laughs> when I joined the unit, actually, I didn't realize that they were actually within a, an improvement plan with the CQC. So it was a required improvement um, facility at the time. But I think they'd had a, another, um, what, what, what do they call those things? CQC visit shortly after I joined and that had gone back up to good. But it also meant that there was a lot of work that had to be, that had to go into it or be put, a lot of things that had to be put in place to make sure that we could meet that CQC um, <clears throat> waiting that the company obviously wanted. But then it just, I think it was generally the, more the attitude of the upper management and the other people within the unit itself like kudos to the nurses i worked with a lot of them were very hard working but it was almost a i don't know if it was because of the background of where i came from but it was a situation where a lot of the nurses didn't want to take responsibility for their own actions so it meant that if there was something that wasn't done because they know that obviously as the clinical leader i probably would get blamed and i probably wouldn't be able to just mm -hmm. ignore it i'd be the one to end up doing it and i was getting overwhelmed like there were days where i didn't leave work until 11 p.m when i should have closed since what? eight <laughs> when i should have closed since eight and it just wasn't healthy i i can count on one hand how many times i ever got to have a break in the i don't know eight to nine months that i worked on there like it was just atrocious there were, day, day, there were days i would go through a whole shift i wouldn't even drink water not the talk of i have time to go to the toilet because it was literally from one thing to the other like wow. i never got any management days i was always always on the floor <laughs> it was just it was just yeah it just it was a lot <laughs> so um i think about two months into the job i realized yeah this is not working so i applied for another job um back in the nhs and it was a substance misuse community practitioner job i think at the time and i'd gotten the job but once again that pay cut still was a big thing because <laughs> <laughs> this time around i was hoping actually that they would put me like somewhere in the second pay progression so the mid spine point of a band six which was a pay cut i was willing to take at the time because it only meant that i was losing about say three four k out of my salary so um, at the time of the interview i'd very honestly told them look this is how much i'm looking for at the minimum for a salary and they'd been like yeah sure sure fine we'll speak to hr and that's fine so i'm like yeah fine no problem <laughs> thankfully i didn't even put in my notice in after that word <laughs> after then because mm -hmm. it would have been interesting because i think yeah. a week afterwards um, they'd come back to me saying, oh, they've discussed it with HR and HR are saying, actually, they can't honor that. They have to go to the first pay progression in band six, which was oh. about 3K at the time. And I'm like, you're asking a lot. <laughs> you <laughs> are really you? asking a lot. <laughs> I moved to Newcastle for a reason and this isn't going to cut it. So obviously I had to turn down the job, unfortunately, and continue where I was. And I think at the time, I started looking at the nurse disability assessor rule thingy thingy because it, sound, it sounded like they, a good work from home, you know, yeah. she would have a job. And I'm like, okay, you know what, maybe this is where I need to go for um, next. So I started looking into that job and I think I had applied for one and they had this like, little quiz thingy that you had to do as part of the application process where they give you like a scenario and they ask you to like triage the patient not three i just that doctors do like take history and like try to like yeah yeah like that exactly but like just some triage slash diagnostic history taking session and i've done that and they'd come back to me say oh you were one mark away from the past mark blah 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 and like you know it was 
fine. I'm not even bothered. <laughs> at this point in time, I'm not bothered. I don't care anymore. Just leave oh me. Oh my god. <laughs> just leave me be. I just desperately needed to leave where I was. Like I just I knew that I wasn't happy. I'd gotten to the point where I'd come back home from work and I'd be crying and my husband would be like, You need to leave this place. You're obviously uh, not like you're frustrated. And I'm like, Yes, I am, but I also have plans and I need money to make these plans happen. So this I can't just leave and like I need something else that, you know but at least get me to where i was going so so um eventually i started looking into the nhs and applying for jobs in the nhs understanding that i will have to take that pay for it and there'll be nothing i can do about it so i said fine so i started applying for nhs jobs and for some reason it was just like nobody liked me at that point in time and it was all unfortunately unfortunate i'm like oh i'm 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 hot cake where i'm coming from do you know who i am (laughs) do you know who i am (laughs) but then eventually (laughs) I think the most important thing for me at that time was I'd gotten to a point where I well I, I didn't want to be a nurse anymore because of the last job I had. Like I'd gotten to a point where you know what being a, a nurse is not worth it. Like there were times where I'm like, oh my god, am I gonna lose my pain because of things that were happening? So I'm like, I don't need that kind of stress in my life. I don't want to be a nurse anymore. I want to do something else. <laughs> so at the time, my husband had actually encouraged me to go into tech because he works in tech, and I'd done a project management um certification degree at the time because i wanted to go, go become a scrum master that was my Ooh. next life career <laughs> that was my next life career by to nursing i want to be a scrum master that's it so i've done the certification course and i think i did my certification exam in april but i started the course in february um all this time i was still working at the job i didn't particularly like but at least i was doing other things on the side that made me feel like i was working towards leaving so that helped mm. me feel a bit better but in March, I went on annual leave and my husband had been saying to me, you need to just resign. You need to just resign. But I didn't want to resign without having I mean, it back. Like, what would I do when I resign? Just sit at home. But he kept saying, like, just resign. It doesn't really matter. Like, we'll be fine either ways. But I, was, I wasn't listening. So in March, I went on annual leave and I'd gone back to London to be with my family. And I think I just looked at how happy I was being in that, that environment and there and then i'm like you know what yeah no job is what's me being sad over so then I, I sent my resignation notice in while i was on annual leave and told them well my last working day will be the last day of my annual leave which means you lot will never see me again <laughs> so um thankfully i was still technically within my probation period so i only really needed to give them a week's notice so i sent my um resignation notice in and became unemployed for i think i was unemployed for about three months mostly out of the fact that i wasn't sure what i wanted to do i didn't want to go back to bedside nursing if i if i thought i was going to do anything nursing related it didn't it wasn't going to be bedside nursing it had to be something else entirely so um i was looking at other jobs that were in bedside nursing and yeah <laughs> it took a minute but i was more focused on going into project management going into scrum so i joined a couple of boot camps at the time that i was doing and just trying to like gain some hands on experience then i think towards the end of the year i started getting restless again like i need to do something else i need a job so i started looking at the nhs again to see what sort of jobs i'll be interested in then i've seen the clinical educator role and i'm like you know what my background is actually general acute medicine and they want a clinical educator for general acute medicine it's not necessarily bedside so maybe this would be kind of like a midway road that would keep me happy so i had applied for the job at the time and i remember one of the exercises that they wanted us to do during the interview was kind of like give a micro teach session on any any topic whatsoever and i don't know if i just didn't read the um this, the description of the interview properly but when i'd done it i'd given it as a presentation and i remember when they came back to me saying well we're so sorry but this time you didn't get the job and their feedback was your interview was excellent but your micro teach session what you gave was a presentation and not a micro teach session so i just essentially reeled off everything on the slide and explained stuff to them without actually actively engaging people asking questions and things like that but actually, I didn't actually, to be fair, I didn't realize that was what they wanted me to do. I thought it was just a presentation. So she's, um, so they said, well, at the moment, they didn't recruit anyone, but um, they were going to be putting the job out again if I wanted to reapply. So I said, okay, no problem. And very randomly, I think I'd forgotten about it. I was looking on the NHS job site again, and I'd seen the job a few days. I'd seen that they posted it again, and this time it was like a, a few days before it was even going to close. So without changing my personal statement or anything, I just reapplied using the same information. 
and I got the interview invite again. And this time I did the interview and I got the job. So, and I work <laughs> as a clinical <laughs> educator. <laughs> and that's Ooh. the long story of how I started and where I am now. Sorry, I know it's a long story. Wow. Wow. <laughs> You've come such a long way in yeah. such a s- I know, short time. time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Wow. Absolutely. Wow. Thanks so much for sharing that with no us. No worries at all. Wow. So you've been a clinical educator for like how many, how many months, years now? Um. So since July. So how many months is that now? Five, six months. Right for six months. So how yeah. how are you finding it? What 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 do you think about um, clinical education? What do you like? What are the challenges? What would you think? Mm, I don't like this about clinical education. Or oh, these are the things that I really love about clinical education. Mm, okay. So um, I like the job. I think it's a very nice um, role, especially for someone who's very firm and not wanting to particularly be at the bedside, but still doesn't mind that be of patient contact because you will still go on the ward and you will still see patients sometimes. But um, I think it's a very interesting role in that you're a jack of all trades, especially if you work in general education and general medicine like I do. You're expected to know everything about all the skills within the clinical areas that you cover. So I cover a very large um, clinical area. I cover the whole of internal medicine and that has quite a number of wards underneath it that I'm responsible for. So I think I'm responsible for about nearly 350 to almost 400 staff altogether. And they all work across a range of specialties. So I've got gastro, I've got respiratory, I've got elderly care, um, I've got infectious diseases, I've got some clinics under me as well. And as you can, as you may imagine, they all have very specific skills to their specialty, which mm-hmm. means I have to learn those skills, be signed off, be competent before I can then teach people those skills. That would be one of the major challenges. It's a lot of upskilling because you have to be competent, you have to be confident in what you're actually teaching because it shows when you don't know what you're talking about and you're trying to teach people. Um, so that, for me, that would be one of the major challenges of it. But in terms of the actual day-to-day of the job itself, to be fair, I think it's quite direct in what the rule is. You're a clinical educator, your job is to teach. Um, but outside of the teaching, there's also like a lot of like pastoral care attached to the role. So you're also responsible for making sure that your nurses are happy. And how are nurses happy? <laughs> making sure that they are confident in their roles and they're actually competent. And um, one of the other things that I tend to do in my job role as well is also support, support people who are struggling within their clinical areas, which might mean I'm spending more time on the ward with them. We're doing medication rounds together. You know, we're sitting down talking about how they plan care and things like that. And there's also a couple of other things outside of what you would expect. So things like all of the competencies that we use within the trust, it's our responsibility to make sure they're all ratified. Um, All of any development that has to do with like changes to how nursing does, how nurses do things in the hospital or how a certain skill is done has to go through us as well. So we sit down together as a team, we discuss it and we change, you know, the competency documents making sure that it's all encompassing. We also deal with a lot of the um, international recruitment nurses. So OSCE OSCE boot camps and preparations is also something that we have to do as well. So make sure that we attend the boot camps, we prepare people and hopefully they will pass their OSCEs and give any helpful feedback when we're required. But yeah, it's a bunch of other things. Like we do so many things, honestly. Everything that you can think of, essentially, that a nurse okay. needs to know in their own role, regardless of where they work, we probably mm. have a hand in it somewhere. So, mm. um, really sounds it. interesting. It is actually because I feel like it's it's such a learning curve because there's so much you have to know, which means you're constantly pushing yourself to want to learn these things as well. And at the mm. end, at the end of the day, you get upskilled such that even though you've never worked in a specialty before, you can probably do all of the things that your nurses can do because you mm. have to teach it so yeah, i mm. think for me that's the best part of it it pushes you it challenges you and then you just gain a lot more so as much as you're giving you're also really receiving in that job so it helps my be- best part of the job will be the fact that i get to organize my own calendar so i decide mm. what, what i want to do How's that that's <laughs> so <cool>. essentially <laughs> um, <laughs> So say for instance, like a typical working day for me would be 
I come to work in the morning, I start at eight, look at my calendar and see what's on there for the day. And whatever is on my calendar is stuff that I have already added on in the, in the first place. So it might be like I've been on the ward. So we have like standard, box standard, like um, training sessions I would have, which would be like your high V drugs, venipunction, cannulation, BLS, um, what are box standard things do we do? Catheterization, like think of all of your, your normal standard skills. So tracheostomy, chest drains, things like that so we already have like box standard trainings that are just mandatory trainings that you have to do for any nurse so things mm. like that would have fixed days that we do them so it might be that once a month we'll have iv drugs training or once a month we'll have any function cannulation training or just whichever one it is so those ones already go on your calendar as a full day training you know when you have them but the other things would be like say for instance i go to the ward and one of the sisters say to me Oh, we need to have this training completed. When can you do it? I'll look at my calendar, look at what day I'm free. That goes on my calendar. It's okay, fine. I'm, I've got availability on this day. We can do it here. And it'll just be a function of depending on what sort of training it is. I might need to find like a room, like the venue for the training and make sure I have the equipment. If I have to invite specialist nurses, I'll have to reach out to them to make sure that they are available and they can deliver the training if it's something that I don't think I can do. Or if it's something that I think is best thought by them, then I'll invite them over. But otherwise, I'll be the one to take the training. So it's things like that. So the more you stay in the role, the more you realize sort of what things you have to do, which means those things go on your calendar. And by the time you go to work the next day, you sort of already have stuff on your calendar that you know that you have to do. And then you go ahead from there, really. So that's what I mean by you control your calendar. I decide what goes on my calendar and I know when I want to do it based on my availability and what resources that I need. So I think I like the <clears throat> control that it gives you because obviously you can plan things based on what's most convenient both for yourself and for the people that actually need to attend the trainings. And things I don't really like, <laughs> um, let's see. Um, yeah, I think the bits I'm, I, I'm not usually a big fan of is the fact that you have to be a jack of all trades. So like I said, it's much more than just doing all the skills that you have to teach the nurses. It's the other things that we do. Like I, I do fit testing. I do BLS training, which technically is not my job <laughs> description as such. Um, what else do I do? I do moving and handling trainings. Which once again, I'm not a moving and handling instructor, but I have to do because capacity within the trust isn't the greatest. So we have to support. Mm -hmm. um, but think of essentially every single thing a nurse has to do. Right. I essentially have to teach some bit of it because trust wouldn't always have capacity to be able to capture every single person. So it, mean, it means that we then have to step up to try to like fill in the gaps. So at the time vaccinations were going on, we had to do vaccinations as well. So it's just all stuff like that, really. So um, I think that for me is a... Oh. There's no clear-cut division of this is where my job ends and this is where my job ends. Right. And that can sometimes get frustrating because it means that the role keeps getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And you don't really... But the pay to... doesn't. Exactly. <laughs> but the pay doesn't. Literally, yes. <laughs> the pay doesn't. The pay is the same. You still have the same number of hours in the day. And it means that you have a lot less time to actually focus on the things that are your core responsibilities, yeah. which you still have to focus on. So it can get a bit tricky. And I think, to be fair, the most important thing is just knowing how to say no. <laughs> no, I do mm -hmm. not have to support that at the moment. Um, right. Unless it's a, it's a direct directly from like your line manager, like the matron. And you can mm -hmm. say, okay, if you're asking me to do this, then can I maybe not do this so I can have time to do this? And it's just being able to negotiate, really. Yeah, it's overwhelmed, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. The only advice I would give is make sure that we're, um, if you're as a nurse, you're a band five, you want to become a clinical educator, make sure that you've done your triple SAP. So that's the standards for student supervision and assessment. Which is kind oh, of so uh, that is, is it like a cost or something that the trust provides? Yes. No, um, so actually, the trust provides is not something you have to do on your own or go pay for it on your own. In my trust, where I worked in London, it was compulsory once you've been at least six months into your job, you have to do it because one of the Wait. NMC. Um, requirements six months before. into your job in any of the nursing roles, in any nursing role, yes. 
right. you have to have done it because it is an expectation that you will be expected to supervise students mm. and you really shouldn't be supervising students until you have that course <laughs> behind you because essentially it just gives you theoretical knowledge into so how to supervise people how to support people and how to assess people properly and put plans in place to support them where required so it was a standard requirement in my trust book standard you have to do it non-negotiable but i know that in newcastles it's not i don't think it's a requirement as such that everybody has to have done it because no, i find because i didn't i remember i didn't i didn't do anything like that exactly most of the people that i know that have done it are people who have been in post for a really long time so they're the ones that you call your, your more senior band fives and they're the ones that tend to have done it. But in my trust, everybody does it. <laughs> so when I come into the trust, really, when I I'm apply for the job, I think that was one of their major requirements, that. And you have to hopefully have done some sort of leadership course. So when I was in London, we had the Nightingale Leadership Academy that I had done as a band six nurse. So that really helped us also. If you can get any leadership course under your belt it helps and make sure like if you're going to be in any teaching role within the hospital you must have done the assessor course so make sure that you've done that as well and then keep an eye out for job opportunities really and know what you're heading into he's not as laid back as it sounds <laughs> it's a lot of work yeah. Is that, do you, have, have you got any um advice for interviews you know um, so I think with interviews, especially with like clinical educator roles, a lot of them would be scenario based questions. So make sure that you practice your star module properly. Because <laughs> um, I think for most scenario based questions, if you're able to use star, so star is kind of like an acronym that um, when you're asked to like describe a scenario where you've done something or how you would react to something, it essentially stands for situation, task, assessment, and recommendation. So I think, or maybe I, I feel like I'm almost talking about S by now. <laughs> I can't get the nothing bit out of my head. But essentially S what was the situation, task, what were you expected to do? Action, sorry, A for action. What did you actually do and what was the result of it? That was what the R is. So it helps you kind of like logically arrange how you're going to talk about that scenario and it helps to really show what part that you played in that old scenario so depending on because a lot of the questions that they will ask in any nhs interview is usually centered centered around the same themes so conflict communication change management if you can find three good scenarios and keep them under your belt using star you'll probably be able to get away with most interviews as long as you know you're able to really what they really want to see in any NHS interview is if you've gotten to the point where you're being invited, it's no longer about your clinical skills because we know that you likely can do it. But it's a, as a person, how would you attack this? Because these are likely some of the situations that you would have to deal with in this role. So how would you deal with it? So you probably have three questions around those topics. And then the other questions will be very specific to whatever role it is that you're applying for. So as a clinical educator, it might be how do you support change management if you've got a staff who is not performing very well or you know they've got something with your attitude how did you address that or let me see to be fair i can't really think right now but i'll yeah, just say <laughs> majority of the questions really think of and i think i mean i know that they're no longer called the six c's of nursing i think they're now called the seven p's of nursing but essentially a lot of those questions as well would be centered around the elements of your six C's of nursing. So if you can find a really good scenario of how you would show or portray those elements, then you will likely be able to answer most NHS interview questions, most at least. Thanks for that. And um, before I forget, I quickly want to ask, so for your current role, you know, we're talking about the pay and all. So did you get, was it closer to what it was in London? So luckily, um, at the time I got this job, or at the time they put the job out again, I think this was just God working in my favor. <laughs> it was when the NHS decided they were going to increase the uh, salaries and put it up yeah. after the strike. Yeah. So it meant that it puts me in what would have been the second spine point or second pay progression that I was willing to take at that very first job that I had to turn uh, down. So um, it's still not what I was, I was earning in London, far from it, but... It's close. <laughs> so <laughs> I, I just felt a bit better about it compared to right. the old 33k they were offering me at the time. Okay, yeah. so um we know that life in London is not the same as life in Newcastle. Mm -hmm. Um 
So what will you say? What will you say about this transition, about this moving? Now for for London, of course your salary was higher. So are your day-to-day spending, if I might say. Now comparing that with Newcastle, what what will you say about it? What, what do you think? Um, so I'd say if if we're being honest, it's not necessarily a pay cut as such, because because just as you've pointed out. For the average person, the outgoings in London would be significantly more compared to um, the outgoings in Newcastle here. But for me, my outgoings in Newcastle were were, were or are actually more than they were in London. And that's mostly because my hospital was smack in the middle of central London. But I was lucky enough that after nursing school, because during nursing school, my brother and I lived together in a two-bed flat. But after nursing school, because I knew that I wanted to, you know, save more money quickly i'd actually lived in a shared accommodation where i was sharing with one other person and my rent at the time including my bills i think was only maximum of 560 because um it fluctuates from month to month depending on if it's 560 in london wow like i said i was very lucky but also bearing in mind i think it all depends on what you're trying to get out of life at the time i moved out of the time i got out of nursing school I wasn't about the flashy lifestyle because I knew what my goals were. I knew what I wanted to do. So I wasn't looking for the nicest house in the nicest area in London. Yes, safety was important to me, but it didn't have to be a pretty house. It just needed to be a box standard house where I could go home from work, sleep, wake up, get out the next morning. And I'll be honest, a lot of times after I moved into my house, and I remember saying to my brother, that the house of my the outside of my house looks like the ghetto. And he used to laugh at me that, are you living on the outside or are you living in living inside the, the house? Inside, <laughs> exactly. But, I mean, it wasn't a bad area at all. I lived in Catford, but I think it was just that particular house I, I, I lived in had like a garden in front that just wasn't well taken care of. And it used to annoy me every single yeah. time. But um, it was a decent sized room and I was only sharing with, I was only sharing my facilities with one other person. So that price was a steal, for, especially seeing how close I was to my hospital. Like it was, a, it was a really big steal, and it was only two minutes from the train station as well, so it was quite convenient. And like I said, it was only five hundred and sixty, depending on if it was summer or winter at the time. So, and I think I didn't really have any other outgoings as such other than um, transportation, and I, I had a travel card. So on average, I probably spent about seventy to eighty pounds on transportation, and my hospital was literally about. I think less than 20 minutes from my house if I took the train. So it was really convenient, like super convenient. So I didn't really have a lot of outgoings as such because that was all I paid for. My house my house, and then transportation. I didn't go out a lot as such because I was always working. I did a lot of um, bank and agency shifts when I could. So I was mostly always working. I didn't really have time for a lot else. So I didn't really have too much money to spend. But then I moved to Newcastle and I think one of the things that shocked me the most was the first two bed flats that we rented in Newcastle <laughs> was five hundred pounds. I could not believe it. I'm like, are you sure they're not trying to scam me? Because I didn't see the house physically. <laughs> at, oh, you're at... thinking it was too cheap. <laughs> it was. It was way too cheap. All I did was an online viewing, and they showed me around. The rooms were decently sized. It looked okay. And I'm like, how can it be five hundred pounds? Like, <laughs> are you sure <laughs> there's not something else? Are you going kidding? On? <laughs> like, is is this normal? But then I, I mean, I'd gone ahead with it, saying, I mean, hopefully we're fine. At least I was only expected to pay like I don't know, maybe like a hundred pounds or two hundred pounds at the time. So I'm like, worst case scenario, this scam is only two hundred pounds. I can live with that. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, um, yeah, I'd moved. Then I came here, and it actually wasn't a scam. So I think in terms of for the average person, it probably would not be so much of a pay cost because things are probably cheaper here if accommodation is like your biggest expense for me it wasn't so you you actually ended up being a bit more expensive because obviously i didn't have to factor in cancel tax and bills and stuff and i think because then i i I wasn't married then so i'd moved in i'd I'd moved out of london single but i was getting married soon which was one of the major Mm -hmm. factors for moving out actually um so i think my bills usually would come up to about 760 almost 800 after i moved to newcastle so obviously i was paying a bit more but bearing in mind the job I was working in at the time was also paying, it was the equivalent of a band seven. So it was also paying me a bit more than I was getting in London, which made more sense to me at the time. So yeah, I think in terms of like the pay, 
it just really depends if your biggest expense in london is accommodation then yes by the time you get here you're probably not taking a pay cut because it probably would level out but every other thing i think is probably roughly about the same i mean transportation i probably did save on transportation when i moved to newcastle as well because where i was working was only a few minutes walk from my house so i used to walk to work so i didn't i wasn't spending money on transportation at yeah. the time so <laughs> i guess that helped so i saved that extra 70 80 pounds there and what else I mean, food is the same thing everywhere. So I don't really think I saved any money there. And I, it wasn't like I went out a lot. So it wasn't like I was saving money on, like, I don't know, going out with friends, restaurants, and things like that. So it really did, it didn't make that much of a difference in terms of my pockets. Maybe it just took a bit more from me. But for the, for the <laughs> average person, they'll probably be saving a lot right. more food somewhere like Newcastle. All right. Okay. Thank you so much, Karen. You've mm. really, you've exposed a lot. Thank you so much for <laughs> this. So thank so you, thank you, thank you. So for people who might probably want to, uh, I don't know, want to connect with you, uh, where can people connect with you? Are you on YouTube? Are you on Facebook? Are you on Instagram? <laughs> Are you on Twitter? <laughs> YouTube? No, maybe I need to start a YouTube career so I can make extra money from YouTube. Yay! Um, <laughs> But no, I do not have a YouTube. I'm on Twitter, but I'm one of those people that does not know how to use Twitter. So I oh, me too. Twitter is not existent <laughs> to me as far as long as I care. As far as I'm concerned, Twitter doesn't exist. Um, Instagram, I'm on Instagram as Karen on the Scrubber Button Day. But once again, I very rarely put anything on Instagram. I think I'm just a proper introvert introvert. So <laughs> I I'm very rarely anyway, if I'm being honest. Facebook. But if they send you a message on Instagram, you'll see. Oh, it. absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. I will see it and I do I do do my best to respond because I know that one of the questions that had to feel a lot was my um the two years postgrad I did I, I can't speak postgraduate degree that I did to cross into nursing. Because I think there had been a time when Someone had put a post up somewhere. I don't remember if it was on Dang, and I'd responded. And the number of messages I got, I'm like, you know, I was actually going to ask you about that. A good idea. I've got a lot. I've got a lot of um questions around that. Also, you know, mm-hmm. for people who are in the UK who probably came in to do masters in something else, and then they want to move to to do um, nothing. So, can you briefly uh, can you briefly tell us? What were the like the main things that you did? Right. So to be fair, I didn't. The requirements were not a lot, as you would expect, because like I said, the, the course that I did at first was nothing related to nursing at all. But I did have, um, I think I can't, they call it the acronym stands for APL. I can't remember what it stands for right now. But essentially, I had to prove that the degree that I did had some sort of similarities to nursing. So essentially was looking at the modules that I did in my first degree and how I could relate them to nursing. And I think if you go to a Nigerian university, because of the number of courses you have to borrow from everywhere else, you would likely <laughs> find so many things <laughs> that you would relate to nursing in terms of, even if it's just like your usual electives that you would do, like your zero degree, like I said zero, zero degree, zero, what did, what did we used to call those things? I don't know, like the module, oh, I can't remember module points I, I don't remember what they are called but i know that in if we used to have to have a lot of like electives that didn't exactly had to your cgpa yeah. but we just did them <laughs> so yeah so things like that depending on which ones you did there'll be so many of them that you could probably relate to nursing so i had to do that obviously they wanted me to have some sort of healthcare ex- experience as well so it might be that you could volunteer in a hospital or volunteer in a care home or it doesn't have to be volunteering you can do it as paid work um you have to do that as well and obviously you have to i think i had to write an entrance examination for all of the schools that i went to and it was a math exam and an english exam if i'm not if i'm not wrong and then you have your nursing interviews that you go for and that's when they let you know if they will take you in or not but in terms of the actual requirements so luckily for me i was not applying as an international student because my family had already been here for a while so i was a home student (coughs) excuse me so I was able to get like um, student loans to like finance my nursing school degree. So finances would be another thing that I would say that most people have to be mindful of because I know that it does get quite expensive, especially as international students if you're going to be doing nursing. So just make sure it is for you before you <laughs> commit such amounts of money into doing it. And if you've been here for a while, 
you are and you're eligible to apply for student loans then by all means get that done i think you also get the 5k bursary now if you're doing nursing so that helps i didn't get the bursary um also i remember i had to do like a life sciences workbook which is essentially a very big book that they give you and it's like a workbook a biology workbook where you have to like fully true with all the answers so that will kind of like count for like your first year of nursing because technically it's a condensed course so instead of doing the bsc for three years we did i did the postgrad for two years so they kind of want you to still make up for that one year of nursing that you've missed so that's why you have your life sciences workbook so it's kind of like a condensed anatomy module basically so you just answer all the questions and then once you're done they usually there's just like a deadline to turn it in and then you Right. give them back give that back to submit that back to the school and then i don't think that you could pass or you could fail because once <laughs> once it, it's a it's an open textbook go look for your answers so as long as you fill in the book i think you'll be fine but i don't right. remember having to do anything specific as such i think they were fine with my um what's it called now? my work and um, results from secondary school because i know usually so, to confirm were you a science student in secondary school um it's complicated <laughs> i was and i was not i was in that i started off as being a science student then when i got to second term i wanted to do something else but um let's just say my family were not as supportive so it meant that i ended up doing both sciences and art till it was time for me to write jam right. <laughs> but, but when the I one you like, submitted was it the wire you submitted was it science sorry so it had all, it had all art courses on them so not science um nothing science related at all no science related so you okay. don't necessarily have to be coming from a science background right in terms of like the other correlations between your previous degree and the nursing degree that you're about to do a lot of the um things that they want to see will be courses related to the biological sciences law ethics sociology and most of us will probably have that um, already because i know that for most people, at least where I had my first degree, all I had to do some sort of sociology course, which was completely unrelated to me at the time, but it does help in life, apparently. Mm. So, yeah, most people would probably have something related to it. You also have to have some sort of, like, math um, module that you'd have done at some point. It doesn't have to be anything major, just any sort of math would be fine. So I had to do math in university, so that was fine for me as well. But I think most people would be able to definitely find things that they can tie together to meet up with the requirements wow wow thank you so much thanks <laughs> thanks. 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 thanks for sharing with us um yeah so i'm going to be dropping your um instagram handle on the screen and also in the description box below if someone right. would like to reach out to you you know for advice or you know yeah, for no, one thing or the other i'm always <laughs> happy to help wherever i can right thank you thank you thank you thank you so much and hopefully we'll see you again on this channel fingers <laughs> crossed <laughs> fingers crossed thank you a me day um guys if you've got any question let's know in the comment section please don't forget to like this video leave your comments below share this video with a nurse that you know and um i'll see you in this other video showing on your screen thank you so much and bye Bye.